Hello and welcome to an episode of Spatial Data Discovery. I'm Professor Davis and today we're looking at the classic NetCDF model using scipy.io.netcdf. Let's see here. It is here. Here is the library information and the link at the top. Uh, for this demo, I've provided you with two scripts found in our spatial data discovery.github.io repository. Here, you will find them under the scripts directory here. And where the ones that we're looking for are the NC read and the NC write. So the first thing you want to do is make sure on your local machine, you go to your repository and Pull any new changes. Already up to date, find the scripts directory and make sure that your files are there. Here we see that we have NC read and NC write. So let's take a look at those. Hop over here to NC read and NC write. Let's start with NC write. So you see that this is to be used with NC read. The first thing is the import modules that are required. OS.path requires us to have date time, numpy, and scipy.io import netcdf. So we're going to be using the netcdf package from scipy.io for input output. At the top, you'll see that I also have defined a global variable called error value. This is so that it will run in any of the functions or code blocks below. Uh, just an easy, convenient way to define that. You'll see that I have defined a function here called NC history, and it takes no inputs and returns a string as the output, and the output string is just the words created and then a string that's read from date time dot date today, so it should just say created today, and it returns that as a string. A little convenience function for just getting that string. We pop down here to the main block. The first thing I do is look to see if the environment variable DS workspace is set on your machine. If it is, it's going to use that as the directory. Otherwise, it's going to use the local directory. So as it happens on my machine, if I echo DS workspace, you'll see that it loads to or points to home user workspace, which is this directory here, home user workspace. <clears throat> here I've got some folders, no files. Uh, that's true for the dollar sign on Mac and Linux. If you are on Windows, you would then use not the dollar sign, but the percent signs around it, which it doesn't work here. Okay. <clears throat> If it's not set, don't worry about it. Just need to make sure that you're going to be creating files in this local directory. That's where it points. It's going to create a file called test.nc, and then I just create the path that points to whatever directory, either this environment directory or the local directory and the file using os.path.join. So it will figure out whether it needs the forward slashes or backslashes, whether you're on a Mac or Windows. All right, line 57. We're going to use the function netcdf underscore file for creating files of the classic netcdf format. This function takes two inputs. The first one is the path to the file that you want to either read from or write to. So here we're going to be passing it the W flag for creating a new file for writing. So it will overwrite any existing files at this location and start writing a fresh new file there. So make sure that you don't use this flag on an existing file that you don't want to lose the data from. It will overwrite it. All right, and the first true block here, all I'm going to do is create some attributes. So for the netcdf files, these have attributes variables and dimensions. That's basically the full uh, model for the classic format. 
So we said attributes can be attached to either the file itself or attributes can be attached to variables. So here I'm going to create attributes attached to the file. The first one I'm going to use is the dot history. This will create essentially the history attribute and then the value of that is going to be pulled from the function nc history which is just the string up here on line 39. The next one I'm going to create is called contact title note and institution for my name, the title of this file, a note to let myself know that I'm, I can safely delete this, and then the institution. Note that these attribute names are more or less defined by you, the author. There are some that you do not want to overwrite because they are protected, and we'll talk about those later. These are safe to create. And uh, if I scroll down here to the bottom, line 105 to 107 shows you some conventions on which attributes you should create or which ones you could create. So if I run this, it's going to put these attributes to the file and then false, false, down here and close. So here, if I type in Python nc write, let me open up this to show you there's no files in there currently. And then it creates the test nc file and we see that it's 280 bytes, not very big. What's in there, what we can do is type in Python nc read and it's gonna open up that file for reading. If I hit this, or run this rather, we see that it says that file attributes for this file are history, contact, title, note, and institution. And we see that those are actually read from the file and we see that today's date, which is in fact March the 21st, is placed in there for the history. How is this happening? So let's go over here and look at NC read. NC read has the same imports this time except for date time. We're not having to create any date times. And if we jump down here into the main block, we see that it's going to do the same file path to the same file that we created. The first thing it's going to do is make sure that that file exists because we don't want to open a file for reading if it doesn't exist. So we use os.path.isfile, do a quick check. Then we do the same netcdf.netcdf underscore file. We pass it the file path that we created up here. And this time, instead of passing it the W, we pass it the R. This is for reading, so it will be opened in read only. You can't change any of the data with an R in the flag. So the first thing it does is print the file attributes and we'll print f.filename. So here's one of the first protected attributes that you don't want to overwrite. f.filename is actually pointing to the actual file name. Uh, and you'll be able to access that in any NetCDF file you open. And then the next one we see is f.underscore attributes. Note that they do use the underscore attributes to try to hide this from you so that you don't accidentally overwrite it. Uh, this is usually a way of creating hidden attributes. This particular one is a dictionary. So if I'm passing this to the print keys function, we see up here, print keys function takes a dictionary. And then what it does is it goes through each key in the keys of that dictionary, reads the value. It does the byte decoding for strings because they're all in Unicode that need decoding. And then it prints the key value pair for you. Otherwise, it'll say if there are no keys, which it just is an attribute uh, error exception block, it'll just print has no keys. All right, so that's the first dictionary that we pass. These attributes are for the file themselves. Then we say file dimensions. So this is the next protected variable or uh, attribute name for the file handle f which is the netcdf file handle. You don't want to overwrite this. Dimensions and variables are protected. They store the dimensions and the variables of the classic netcdf file. So these are going to print the dictionaries to say what are the dimensions and this is going to print what are the variables. And currently we see that they print nothing because we have neither dimensions nor variables. 
and then it's going to look in each of the variables and print the variable attributes. And if we have no variables, we have no variable attributes. And then it's going to look to see if I actually have a variable called image and then try to open it and print it. Haven't gotten there yet. So let's back up to this idea of variables and dimensions. So in the first false block here, I'm going to change it from false to true on line 67. And here, what we're going to do is create our first dimension. So we create the file pointer here on line 57. We add some attributes to it in this first true block from line 59 to line 65. And then down here on line 71, we create a dimension. This is being created in the file, which is F. What we pass this function for creating a dimension is a name. So whatever dimension name you want to call it. So I want to create in this example, an image of some random noise colors. So just sort of a weird pixel block with rainbow colors in it. So to create a color pixel block, I need, well, I, I want to create dimensions for the columns, for the pixels, the rows for the pixels, the colors for the pixels, and then the pixels themselves. So the dimensions of this are going to be columns, rows, and colors. So here the first dimension is Y. These are going to be for my rows. How many rows do I want? I pass it a number. I want 720 rows. Uh, row index, uh, yeah, so that's, this is the height of the image, if you will. All right, so that's the dimension, and that's all there is to it. You create a dimension, you give it a name, you give it a value. What if you want to know what are these values of the dimension? You can give them meaning by creating a variable. So the next thing I do on line 72 is do a create variable. Now I'm going to create it by passing it a name. I'm going to pass it the same name or create with the same name as the dimension. I don't have to. There's nothing that says I need to. This is a way of creating a convenience variable so that if you said, what does dimension Y mean? There aren't any attributes for dimensions, but you can attach attributes to a variable and you can even put values in them. So here I'm going to create a variable. I'm calling it y because I want it to be related to the dimension y. Then you pass it the variable type or the data type. So i is for integer. So I'm going to create an integer variable. And then in parentheses here, this is the dimensions of the variable. Note that the dimensions here, I've passed it y. This is not the variable name, even though it is. Why it was created in the file? How was it created up here? It was created as a dimension. So by default, you pass the dimensions by name here instead of by value. I could have typed in 720, but then you break the whole system of how NetCDF is supposed to work. It works by creating variables that depend on dimensions. So here I pass it the dimension y. y is the dimension up here, which has the number 720 associated to it. So y should just be 720 values. Currently, it's going to be a bunch of nulls, or no data, or however you want to define it, empty memory space. So I want to point to that space. So I'm going to use the splice for the array. So the splice is just the square brackets with the colon. That allows me to point to that memory in Y. And what am I going to pass it? I'm going to pass it an array of data. The array I'm going to pass it is just numbers from 0 to 720 in stepping up by 1. No, I'm sorry. From 0, pass it 720 integers step by 1. So this is going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 719. So that's your 720 numbers. All right, so I've created a variable and I've passed it data. So now my variable has numbers in them. They are integers. And then you can create attributes to 
variables. So this is the same syntax, the dot operator here, y dot units. So units is a good one to have for variables because typically your variables are measurements or some kind of model value and you want people to know what are the units. So here it's just row index, not that exciting. All right, down here on line 77, I'm gonna create the next dimension. So I have my rows, now I wanna create my columns. So for me, I want there to be 960 columns, so it's a little bit wider than it is tall. I'm going to create the dimension, giving it name X and value 960. As a way of making this more convenient for myself and for those who read this file later on, I'm going to create a variable to help define this dimension. Again, here I'm just going to create the variable with the same name as the dimension X. That way you can easily see that this variable is to help define that dimension. It's going to be created with integer values because I'm just creating index. They don't need to be floating point. They should, they actually have to be in the, or integers. And then I pass it its dimensions. And this time I'm passing it X by name, which is the dimension X up here, which is just 960. So X should be 960 values. What are the values? Right now there are no data. So here on line 79, I use the square brackets colon to point to all those values. And I save, again, an array of numbers here again from zero. Starting at zero, I want 960 values incremented by one as integers. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to 959 are gonna get saved into X. And as good practice, dictates where in line 80 I'm going to give it an attribute. So the variable attribute I'm creating is units and I'm going to call these call index or column indexes. All right, so I've got my rows and my columns. Now I want the end dimension for color. So here on line 83 for a color image, typically you have red, green, and blue. So that's three. So the dimension that I'm going to create is just called color, so my color dimension, and I'm giving it value three. Now to make this a little bit more convenient or to help whoever's reading this, I'm going to create a variable associated with the dimension. Again, I'm, this is out of convenience. So the creating the variable, I'm going to use the same name as the dimension. This is so that it's easy to understand that it's related to that dimension. So oh, this is the color variable. Notice that it's not an integer. C is for character. So I'm going to say the character array. And here, the dimension is color. So it's going to be of size 3. So color is of size 3. What are the three values? 0, 1, and 2 are R, G, and B as characters. And then line 88, I'm going to give it a standard name because you might not think, what does color mean? I don't. I don't know what color means. So the standard name is RGB, and then the units are just red, green, and blue color bands. That kind of help define what this is. So now if I run NC write, so here it is, NC write, and rerun NC read, we see that the file attributes again are the same. This time we see file dimensions. So I have three dimensions that I've created, Y, X, and color. And then the values of them are printed, 7, 20, 9, 60, and 3. So this comes from NC read print dimensions. So this dictionary, f.dimensions, has the names of the dimensions and the values of the dimensions. Then I print the variables. Right now, the variable names are the same as the dimensions, right? Because we just created those. So here I'm printing them. And what they print are the names of the variables and then a pointer to the variable itself, which is why you have this weird brackety thing here. Then the next thing I do for each of the variables, I'm going to print that variable's attributes. So I only have three variables, X, Y, and color. X has an attribute units, Y has an attribute units, and color has 
two attributes, standard name and units. So we see that how this read function works. But still we don't have any data. Well, at least we don't have any pixel data. I just have variables for the dimensions, which is great. But I want my actual image. So down on line 91, I'm going to turn the false block into a true. And here we see that I'm going to create an image variable. The variable name, notice that I didn't create any dimension for this. Why? Because we've already created the necessary dimensions to create the three-dimensional array. So here I'm going to call it image just for lack of a better name. I'm going to pass it integer values for a standard color image. You would imagine it being just integer numbers between 0 and 255. And then the dimensions, here's where it's interesting. It's no longer a one dimension like it was for the variables pointing to dimensions. Now this is an n-dimensional array. What is its dimensions? It's going to be color by y by x, which is to say it's going to be 3 by 720 by 960. Okay, so there is my matrix uh, well, it's actually of depth 3. Okay, then I'm going to create some standard attributes to this variable. Again, I'll point down to line 106 to help note which ones you should create for a, an array of data that you're going to visualize. For example, you'll, you'll want to note the fill value and missing value, which are typically the same. And here, I'm just pointing to that global variable error value. This helps define that for visualization so that you don't get wonky values in your analysis or wonky colors in your, in your map. Long name is just a nice way of giving somebody a longer description of what this variable is. Random RGB color band image, which is, I guess, lack of a better name. No units because it's just a color image. I don't really know what the units of this would be. Pixels of color. I don't know. Anyways, I said none. The valid minimum, valid maximum are 0 to 255. And then instead of passing all of the values using the, the splice like we did with X and Y, I'm going to access each color band. So this should be red, green, and blue on lines 101, 102, 103. And I'm going to pass each one of those this two-dimensional array of numbers. What are the actual numbers? I'm using random.randomint to create random integers between 0 and 255. And the dimensions are going to be 720 by 960, which is to say height by width, which is a little bit confusing for image processor people because usually it's width by height. Here, it's height by width. All right, so we pass just some random numbers to red, green, and blue. Uh, and then we close. So let's go ahead and try that. So before we do, with just the dimensions and the variables of the dimensions, our file size is 7.3 kilobytes. Now let's write our full file, and we see that it is 8.3 megabytes. So we filled it up with an image. Let's go in here and read what we just wrote. Here we see that the file attributes print again, which we know from before. Here we see the three dimensions that we created. Now we see variables include image, and there's the pointer to image. So we have four variables, three that point to dimensions, and one that is our image, our three-dimensional image. All right, so then let's look at each individually, x, the attributes of x for units, y units, image. So this is the new one. We see it has fill value, missing value, long name, units, uh, valid min, valid max. And color was there before. And at the very bottom here, it says red three bands, 720 rows by 960 columns. That comes from this line block down here if image is in f.variables. So remember, f.variables is a dictionary of all of your variable names. They are saved as keys. So you can look for keys in the variables. So if image in f.variables just says, does the variable image exist? 
and then down here on line 72, this is how you access the data. So f dot variables, remember, is a dictionary. So a dictionary, you pass it a key in brackets. So I'm going to pass it the name image, which should get the variable image from the file. Looking at that variable, I can then access the data using the dot operator dot data. The dot data is a pointer to the file's data in memory. If you want access to that data after you close the file, you need to do the dot copy. That will bring it out of the file and into your local memory so that you can still process it. And here all I'm doing is printing the shape. The shape should be 3, uh, 720, 960. So it just unpacks the three numbers here as 3, 720, and 960. All right, what does this file actually look like? I'm going to come into QGIS, create a new project. Apologies, this is QGIS 2. For those of you who are wondering why it looks so different, if you're running QGIS 3, same idea, come up here, add a raster, find the workspace, find the test MC file and open. It's gonna complain that it doesn't know what the CRS is and that's fine. And if we look at the actual file here, we see that it is just some crazy random noise. And then if we look down here at the properties, we see that it is 960 rows by, or 960 columns by 720 rows. And then the data value is read from the from the file attributes. If you look over at metadata, you can come down to the bottom and scroll through and you can read all about the different um, attributes for each of the dimensions, the files, uh, sorry, the attributes for the file and the attributes for the variables. Dimensions don't have attributes. Okay, so there it is, creating a random noise image using the NetCDF classic data model. Uh, I hope you learned something from that. Uh, all right. Thank you, and stay tuned for the next one.